Hey, 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 what's up, people? If you regularly watch the uh, random stuff that I post, you may have seen the video I did uh, investigating the power supply that had failed in a Dell Optiflex 790 that I was using as the router for my home network. And in that video, I mentioned that I wasn't too worried about that machine failing as I had already planned to replace it with uh, one of these Lenovo uh, ThinkCenter M900 Tinies. And I had already installed uh, PFSense on it, which is what I was using on that Dell uh, 790. And so I had already uh, configured it as basically a drop-in replacement for that machine. Uh, I also mentioned that these machines only come with uh, one Ethernet port in the back. Uh, there is a normally a Wi-Fi antenna right here, but this one here, I wasn't using it, so I took it off there. So it only has a one Ethernet port, so I needed a way to add a second port, and that way I'd have one that I could use for the uh, LAN and the one that I could use for the uh, WAN, so local area network and the uh, wide area network. And a viewer that watched that video asked if I could do a video showing how I added the second port to the machine. And I thought it was a reasonable request. So that's going to be this video. So I did order a second card. But unfortunately, the listing where I had originally ordered the first card from, it's, uh, which was shipped from the uh, U.S., uh, it, they no longer had it in stock. So I had to order from another seller in China. And this is all on eBay, by the way. So it took a little longer to get, but it only took about like 10 days to arrive. So it really wasn't that bad, like all things considered. Now, while I was uh, trying to figure out how I could add a second port to this machine, I kind of found like two ways that I could do so. And so all this is going to be pretty uh, specific to like this particular machine. It may apply to other similar machines as well. I just don't have any experience with anything else. So some things uh, may need to be tailored to like your specific needs and whatnot. Now, the first method is actually uh, pretty pain-free, but your OS has to support it. It involves using a, a Realtek uh, RTL 8125B card that uses the M.2E port, which is in uh, the front of this machine. It's up here in the front. We'll see it here in a minute. Uh, this only takes like a few minutes to install, and it's probably the best option if you don't need to have like Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. Uh, unfortunately for me, I could not get this card to work with PFSense. Even manually installing the drivers, I could not get an IP to be assigned to it, and um, it wouldn't connect or anything. So I kind of abandoned trying to get this one to work. And this card does work pretty well with Windows, and that's how I verified that it was actually uh, working uh, when I received it in the mail. So I don't know. This card may work with other versions of uh, Linux, but I, I haven't tried anything else. So uh, pretty much that, that's the only experience I have with it. The uh, second method, which is what I ended up having to do, it uses an Intel i225 card, and it's definitely a little bit more involved. And unfortunately, it also prevented me from using the M.2 M key port, which is what I would have used for the SSD. I still had the SATA connector available inside of here, so it really wasn't too much of a problem. It was more of an inconvenience. So both of these options will add one 2.5 gigabit uh, Ethernet port to your machine. And on this particular uh, device uh, you normally have these three display ports so it it'll end up it ends up eliminating uh, one of them but if you're just going to be using this for a network device anyway it doesn't really matter too much so let's take a look inside of this and we'll see what we're dealing with and what the uh, challenges are and now here's a top down view of the machine with the cover removed as we can see everything in here is uh, really compact so we don't really have a whole lot of room for for much so uh, the parts we're interested in for the first card is actually the connector up here. That's the uh, E key connector. Got to remove this uh, thumb screw here from this uh, drive caddy. And then this pulls forward. That comes off. Uh, you can see that I've got the, uh, I think this was the Bluetooth antenna for when you have a Wi-Fi and Bluetooth card installed in that uh, slot. That's uh, where that connects to. So as you can see, I've already got something populated in there, and that's only because I was using this machine to uh, experiment with uh, Home Assistant and uh, Frigate NVR. And at the time, these uh, Google uh, Coral TPUs were fairly difficult to get in the uh, M.2 A and E key version, but the uh, mini PCIe ones were pretty abundant. So I used an adapter that goes from the uh, A and E key M.2 to a mini PCIe E uh, little uh, board here, so I just kind of stuck that in there, used this ribbon cable to connect it to, but that's totally irrelevant to uh, what we're doing here today, so I'm just going to remove this board. All right, so there we go. We have access to that uh, E key M.2 port, 
So this Realtek card would basically just pop in, in there like that. You put the screw back on, and uh, that's the installation of the card. In the back here, we just have to remove this uh, deep, deep display port connector. And so once that's out, we just have to pull the connector off the board right there. So there we go. Now we've got a uh, open uh, slot right there in the back that we can put the connector on. And because this is basically a purpose made for things like this, it, it's just a basically a, a drop-in replacement. The screws line up uh, perfectly. And all you have to do is just put these uh, screws back on. And there we go. There's your second port. Now, if uh, you're using this caddy, it's just a matter of uh, sliding it back on. Like that. Put this uh, thumb screw back over here. And if we look up here in the front, we see we've got the headers for the connectors here, like uh, exposed. So all we have to do is connect them like this because they're actually, this is the orientation that they're supposed to go in. And there we go. Now we just have to make sure that this cable kind of stays tucked in here so it doesn't interfere with the case. And that's uh, sitting there like you can see it's pretty flat. So it's easy to uh, put the cover back on. And there we go. All done. So <laughs> this one's, uh, like I said, a pretty uh, quick and painless. And as long as uh, whatever you are using as an operating system supports it, it works uh, totally fine. And now for the uh, second type of card. Before we actually try to install it, we'll see what we get here in the box. So as you can see, we've got this low profile uh, bracket for the Ethernet port. We're not going to use that. We also get the actual connector right there, the Ethernet uh, jack. And it also comes mounted in the uh, longer bracket. And so you can see here that it's got uh, headers. And that's what these cables that it also includes in the box are for. So we've got one uh, set of headers here that has uh, four contacts. That's for the like the status and connection LEDs in the back. And then we've got one that has a total of, this one has 10 pins. And that's for the actual like data lines and ground. So those are the two. Uh, and they're not very long, as you can see. So this is the actual card. This is the Intel i225 chip right there. And so you can see that this card here comes in the uh, 2280 size, but you can also trim it down to use it in like a smaller space. Uh, I can actually leave this one the way it is. And uh, I don't know if you're going to be able to uh, tell here already that we have a problem. And that's the fact that these headers stick up uh, quite a bit. So if we look back at the, at the uh, machine itself, we see that the M.2 uh, M key slot is right here in this uh, area. And so that's going to require using the uh, space that would normally be used by the SSD for the uh, Ethernet card. So let's go ahead and remove the card, or actually the SSD that I have in here. And on this one here, this little button here just pops out of that uh, standoff. Okay, so pop this card in. Then I can just lock it in place like that. And can you tell the problem? <laughs> so if we were to uh, try to put the drive caddy back on, now it can't go down. Like it's not going to fit like at all because these pins stick out so much. And so that requires removing these uh, headers and replacing them with something else. But not only are they a problem here on the actual uh, interface card itself, Let's remove the uh, jack here from this uh, back bracket. And let's plug these in here just for the example. Now you can see that if we were to put this jack here in the back, hey, that rhymes. Well, first of all, I'm having a hard time trying to slide it in because it's inter the, the pins down here are interfering with uh, some of this stuff down here. But if we can get it to uh, go all the way in like that, yeah, you see, this is the problem. You can't put the case on. Which I guess wouldn't be a big deal if you uh, wanted to like, leave it open or whatever. And then you can just like plug these in. And I mean, it'll work. But I did not want to do that because I wanted to be able to close the case. And I also needed to be able to use the uh, the SATA slot or the uh, SATA connector right there. You can see how the those pins like 
totally interfere with it. So I had to come up with a different solution or a solution. So what I came up with is um, the only way that I was going to be able to uh, get like a, a lower profile connection between the actual uh, interface board and the jack was to solder some wires directly from this board to this board and eliminate these uh, pins altogether. So um, one way I guess you could do it, which is not what I did, is you could take uh, the cables that already came provided in the box and like trim the uh, connections here off and then just solder uh, the pins like from like the, the pad here to the corresponding pad on this side. And they're pretty much one to one. So like if you line them up like this, you can see there's a little arrow right there on that on the uh, four pin header right here. So that pin there corresponds to this pin here. And then this pin here would correspond to that pin there. And the uh, same thing for the, the 10 pin connector. You can see we've got uh, arrows on both of them. So it's just a matter of like wiring it one to one. But I didn't want to uh, chop up the one that came with the, uh, the first card that I bought just in case I needed to um, use it for something. So what I ended up doing instead is I actually got a piece of um, HDMI cable from this uh, cord that had a, a bad connector on one end. And I just basically kind of figured out what sort of length I would need to go from like the one, the SSD card or not the SSD, the M.2 card that was going to connect uh, in there and how I could route it to get it all the way to the connector in the back. And, you know, I measured out like a little bit extra. So I said maybe about like that much right there. So I cut a piece of that off. And the reason why I went with this HDMI cable is uh, due to the fact that if we pull this out, First of all, you see we've got some nice like braided shielding over it, but inside, if we pull out all the contents, we unravel this aluminum foil, we actually have four twisted pairs of wire that are shielded. And I think these are probably a better option than going with the cables that came provided with the uh, card because I don't think these are, I haven't, I haven't actually opened one of these up, but I do, I doubt that they're shielded inside or anything. So these are just basically like wires like straight through from one end to the other. So I wanted to go with something that might maintain like uh, signal integrity a little better. And so that's why I went with these. And the cool thing about these, or at least the ones that come inside of uh, this uh, HDMI cord is that they are color coded or they're colored differently. As you can see, we've got a gold one there, a green, this uh, plain like silver one, and then this, uh, I think it's supposed to be red, but it looks kind of pinkish. So I thought these would be perfect for that. And not only that, but we also get like a bunch of other uh, uh, thinner strands of, of a wire. And we can use like four of these for the actual like LED indicators. And so I kept four of the single stranded ones. And then I kept... Uh, the four uh, twisted pairs. And I also used this uh, single, basically this was uh, like grounding for the, like this uh, stranded stuff. Let's see, I'm gonna, I'm gonna trade this uh, purple one here for this red one just to have a little more contrast there. And so that's basically what I used to make a cable that went from the, the actual uh, chipset card to the jack. The only other problem we have here is uh, how to attach this to the back of the case so that it's secure and it's not like, you know, rattling around or moving around in there. And unfortunately, this one does not come with a bracket like the other uh, Realtek one does. So I had to make uh, something. And I guess one option that I didn't really think about till now is uh, like taking one of these brackets and cutting it up so that you keep the part of the shielding here. We'd have to cut off the top there because the jack like pretty much totally touches this top part and then uh, drilling some holes so that they match up with the holes in the back so it'd be like maybe something like like that and then uh, uh, drilling out the holes that match up with these uh, slots here on the side using some screws and some nuts or whatever to hold it in place so that's uh, like I said that's one option that I hadn't really considered till just now but what I ended up doing is I designed and printed out this little sort of a bracket here that has uh, holes on the bottom that line up with the uh, inner holes right here on the jack. 
and then we got these two holes that line up with the or that align with those um slots in the back of the case and so this actually uh, holds it in there pretty secure once uh, all the screws are in place and if you look at it there it fits something like this would focus For some reason it wants to focus on these wires get out of here <laughs> okay there we go so as you can see like everything lines up pretty well you can stick your um your plug in there and it's uh, totally fine it doesn't take up very much room but the only issue with using this uh, printed part is that um, there's no um, conductivity in the plastic because it's not like it's uh, conductive or anything like that. And I do want to make sure that I have a good connection between the case and the grounds on this uh, board. So I don't remember exactly what I used, but I think what I did is I just got some aluminum foil and I glued it to the, the um, this PLA piece. And then, like, you know, once you screw it in and all that, then, like, the, the surfaces are making contact with the uh, ground points and all that. So I think that's what I did. I don't think I used, like, foil tape or anything like that. Although I was thinking about it, and I do have some of that copper uh, foil tape that I could use to just, like, apply it to here, like, around to the bottom. And then once uh, the screws are in place, you know, and they puncture it, everything, like, makes uh, good contact. One little design change that I made to this a new piece that I printed that I didn't do on the one that I used in my uh, other machine is that I put like a tiny little bevel right here on the end, right there on that corner. Because when you put the case on right here on the back, it's got this sort of like little lip right there. When you slide it into place with the flat one, it would just like stop right there. And I ended up having to like lift up a little bit right here on the end before I could like fully slide it in, into uh, place. So I put this little uh, bevel there. So I'm hoping that maybe once I try to like put this on, it'll just uh, slide over it just fine. Not sure yet, I haven't tried it, but I'll show you how I went about uh, soldering all these wires uh, between this board and the uh, actual like interface board. So we've got to remove these pin headers off of these boards. And thankfully these boards are not very thick and they're not very big. So they don't take very much heat in order to be able to uh, get them off. If we don't have like a desoldering uh, sucker or like a desoldering uh, gun or anything like that, it's easy to just flood them all with solder, heat them all up, and then they'll just like drop out easily. So it helps to use flux to remove them, but I think even without flux, it's really not that difficult if you just flood everything with solder. So we'll start by removing this four pin connector right here. And heat it up once it starts, uh, once it feels like it starts moving. There it goes. See, that didn't take very long. That was a real time right there. And it just uh, came right out. So I'll do the same with this eight pin connector here. I'll also try to do this uh, real time. I'm not cutting any of this out. Just going back and forth, making sure that the solder there is heating up all those pins fairly evenly. There it goes, and pops right out. So, real easy. And there we go. That's uh, all connectors removed from both boards. All we need to do now is just clean them up. I'm just going to use some wick for that. And I'm leaving flux all over the surface here of the, of the bench. All right, so that's with all the uh, pins removed. And now we just have to uh, clean these up a little bit. I just got these bottles recently. They're actually pretty neat. You put the, uh, you can pump like alcohol up here to this uh, sort of like little surface and you can just dab your swabs in there and go to town on whatever you're trying to clean. I like it. And usually what I would do is I would just like spray them with this uh, little alcohol spray bottle, but that just makes alcohol go like everywhere. And this is a little bit more controlled. So just thought I would uh, show that real quick. Go ahead and finish cleaning these up. Spray still comes in handy for stuff like on the surface, though. And there we go. That's both uh, boards with the pins removed. And it's very important to make sure that none of these traces are broken because they are really, really thin on both of these uh, boards. But because I didn't have to put like any pressure or anything down on them, the, everything came out uh, relatively uh, undamaged. So everything looks pretty good. And we're ready for the uh, next step, which is uh, prepping the cable. And it's honestly probably... <laughs> the uh, most time consuming part of this entire process. So aside from the conductors that are gonna go inside of the cable, the only other things that I'm gonna need is I'm going to reuse the part of the jacket 
from the uh, HDMI cable, uh, the one that I pulled everything out from, and some uh, heat shrink. I've got these uh, really, really thin ones right here, and these are going to be used for the grounds, or that's what I used for like all the uh, ground connections. And then a little bit of a thicker heat shrink here that I can actually stick around the the jacket of the this little rubber jacket here, but this is a little too thin, so I'm going to have to get something thicker or something with a bigger diameter. Ah, here we go. This will work just fine. I guess alternatively, we could just use the entire thing as like heat shrink and use that as the jacket. But um, when you shrink it, it I mean, it, it'll form to whatever shape you need. So it's it's fine if you're, uh, you know where it's going to go. But I wanted this to stay kind of flexible. And so that's why I decided to reuse the jacket. The heat shrink becomes pretty stiff once it's uh, shrunk. So I kind of want to uh, i'm gonna have to trim off some of the this uh, jacket here because it makes no sense to have this be the same length as the wire we obviously want the wires to be uh, protruding out from the end so that we can have some uh, room to solder them to the boards so if we were to make this maybe about like a, an inch shorter than uh, needed and on the opposite side you know about the same so i'm going to trim about two inches off of this one here so i'm going to say maybe about like right there so I'm only actually going to be using this much of the jacket to uh, cover up all these uh, wires. And so that's going to work like that. And same thing with this shielding, this braided uh, shielding here. It's only going to have to be as long as the uh, jacket is. So I'm going to trim that to about the same length. Uh, probably better if I use these scissors here. There we go. So that's those uh, pretty much prepped there. And now it's a matter of getting everything here to fit through the abrading uh, and the easiest way i found to do that is to uh, put everything together here put a little piece of tape on the end here to bunch everything up together and kind of make it a point and then we can more easily like slide it through and as i said i also want to use this uh bare wire that's um, not coated in any sort of a uh, like plastic jacket or anything this is actually going to be part of the ground and it should also help make contact with like this braiding here to uh, ground it out so I'm just going to try to get all these to be about pretty even there on the end. And then I'm just going to wrap it up with a little bit of capped on tape. Like that. Make the tip a little bit pointy. This isn't perfect, but kind of works. It also helps to open up the end a little bit here by just kind of like pushing on it like that. And if we can flare it out a little bit, it's even better. All right, so ignore all of that. You'd think I would have prepped better for this, but I went to go check on the other one that I built just now, and uh, I, I didn't actually use anything. I didn't use any foil, and I didn't use the uh, the, the braiding because all of these were already uh, shielded. So I just uh, stuck everything through the jacket, and it's definitely uh, much easier to do so like this. And because there's not like a lot of cables and a lot of uh, shielding and stuff, the cable itself actually remained like pretty flexible. So I'm just going to push everything through like this. If I hold it here from the end and I push from the bottom, actually helps it slide a little better. There we go. So got it out the end. And then just pull about an even amount there. So like I said, if you want to make a custom cable, then you can go with this method. If not, probably just <laughs> using it as is and just trimming off the extra stuff and putting like some maybe like heat shrink like right there so that this stuff is not exposed. That would be totally fine. All right, so now we can pull the capped on off of this end. And there we go. Got this red one here is a little uneven, so just pull it back out there so it's even. That's uh, getting there. And as you can see, it still remains uh, pretty flexible so that it can be kind of like routed in here and it comes out this end here and it's not like putting a lot of pressure in like any sort of direction. While these cables are still pretty easy to identify like this because they still have that shielding, we do have to trim it back, and that's going to remove this coloring. And the thing is that inside, once we peel this uh, foil back, kind of difficult here because of how thin they are. Okay, there we go. I got two of these opened up. As you can see, inside each pair, they are both uh, green and white, and they also have this uh, like grounding right there. So it's going to be hard to identify which cable is which once we remove the foil from each pair. And like I said, I want to pull the foil back so that it's kind of like even here with the uh, with the rest of this jacket. So what I did to be able to identify them easily is I got a marker and I made some 
marks like across the both wires like this. So right there, I see that I have like, like one mark on both of those. And then on the second one, I did two marks. Like that. And so once we got all of these opened up and we have them all marked on the other end there, it's easier to identify which end goes to what. It's just a matter of keeping track of which uh, mark we made on which color. So now these here, we can just uh, cut them uh, pretty flush there with the end of the cable or the jacket. And so now when we have something like this, now we can't really tell which color is what without like really closely examining it. But since we've got marks on every uh, wire pair, then we uh, will know exactly which one it is on this side. So I'm going to do the same to the other side, and then we'll go on to the uh, next step. And there's the other end completed. So now, as you can see, we have no idea which color is what, but since we've got all the marks on the wires there, we'll be e easily able to identify which uh, pair goes to what. And I guess technically, if you just did not mark one of them, like on this side and didn't mark one of them on, on this side, that would be your indicator, you know, of which is what. But if you accidentally rub the marker off of uh, any of the pairs, then uh, things might get a little more confusing. So I think it's just better to just to mark them all anyway. And that way there's like absolutely no confusion at all. So the next thing I want to do is take care of the grounds. Now, there's two ways that we could do this. We could just take all of the unshielded, uh, like unjacketed uh, wires that are in here, bundle them all together and solder them to one of the holes on uh, each uh, of the uh, boards here. But I didn't want to do that only because I wanted to have a little bit of redundancy in case uh, like one of the strands broke. And so I wanted to actually use uh, both of the uh, grounding holes on the, both boards. And so what I did for that is I actually took the uh, this is the uh, the main ground or the like the outer uh, ground wire. That's the one that it's not part of like any of these uh, pairs. So I took that one, kind of set it off to the side there. And then I took two pairs or two of the uh, grounds from the uh, twisted pairs, set those aside like that, and then found the other two. It's kind of a jungle of wires here right now. All right, there we go. So I've got a pair here, and i got a pair here. And so what I'm going to do with the one that's not part of uh, one of the jacketed sets is that I'm going to untwist it, and I'm going to uh, take uh, even amounts. Well, actually, you can't make them even because there's actually an uneven amount of strands uh, that makes up that one wire. So I'm going to take, let's see, there's, I think there's a total of like seven wires. Yeah, so I'm going to take three and set them off to this side, and then I'm going to take four and bring them off over this way. And I'm just going to try to make sure that the ends here like are all kind of like evenly aligned there. I might need to pull on this side a little bit just to get it so that it's even. Yeah, that's pretty okay right there. Okay, so I'm going to take those four and twist all of these together. So I have like a single strand. And then I'm going to take the other three and twist them together with the other pair of grounds. And there we go. Now I've got two ground wires, and one of them is just slightly thicker due to the fact that it's got one extra strand than the other one. But like I said, that way I have a little bit of redundancy of uh, grounding between the uh, two boards in case uh, one of them happens to uh, break for whatever reason. So the only other thing to do is to put a piece of heat shrink, a really thin heat shrink, on uh, both of these. So I'm just going to try to kind of like eyeball it here. Kind of want it to be around, around that length. That way I have a little bit of uh, the wire like sticking out at the end. And I'm just going to cut two pieces off the same length. So we have something like that. And all we have to do now is just shrink them. And there we go. Now we've got our two uh, ground wires and they are protected here so that once uh, we like put them on the board here, we don't have like a bunch of exposed um, uh, grounding that might short like against something else. It's just on the ends there where it's going to uh, solder into the board. So I'm happy with that. Now I'm going to try to make sure that I've got about an even amount of wire sticking out on both ends here, like maneuvering it around and everything kind of like, as you can see there, I, it's really not very even anymore. So I'm just going to try to even that out by pulling a little bit on the other side and pulling back any that are sticking out a little too much, even though um, 
after uh, we put the other piece of heat shrink here, you can still sort of pull them back a little bit. It's not a big deal. All right, so it's not excellent, but it's better than it was. So now I'm going to take a piece of heat shrink here and apply it so that I have about like that much of the uh, cable left out. And I don't need to have like this entire length of heat shrink here. So I'm just going to leave it to about like right there. So it looks like I can actually cut this piece in half there and I'll have enough for both sides. So I'm just going to trim it. And put it on like that. So just want to have a little bit of it sticking out past the, uh, the jacket. And I'm going to go ahead and shrink that. And uh, there we go. So that kind of protects the ends here from where the, all those um, like foil shields and everything kind of uh, might stick out a little bit. Helps uh, prevent those from like shorting up against the other stuff. Like you can see right there, like if it were to make contact with that transformer or something, it might have affect things. So that way we only have the wires that we're going to be soldering onto the board there exposed. And so I'm just going to finish up this side by doing the same thing with the grounds and putting in the uh, heat shrink on the uh, grounds and then the other piece of heat shrink here for the jacket. And this cable is pretty much done. It's just a matter of soldering it onto the boards. We're almost ready to solder the ends of these wires to the two boards here. And ideally, we'd want to have the ends here pre-tinned so that when we put them through the holes, it makes it easier to uh, solder. Now, ideally, we'd want to take like the strand of cable Strip a little tiny bit of the end there to expose the uh, wires underneath or inside. And then uh, tin the end by applying some solder to it. But I'm going to show you why I'm not going to do this with uh, this cable. So if we take the solder here, heat this up, and apply the solder there. You can see how the jacket shrank back a bit. And it's not really a big deal. And here I could probably make that work. The thing is that I don't want the wire sticking out a lot like that. And sure, I could trim it, but I found that with this uh, really thin gauge cable like this, if you just heat up the like the very end of the jacket of the wire you're trying to uh, tin and apply the solder, it shrinks back by itself and it exposes just enough to be able to stick it in these holes and uh, solder each one to you know where it goes. And that way, it also makes it so that you don't have a lot of uh, wire sticking out on the other side, which is what I'm really trying to avoid, particularly on this board, just because of the fact that it's got to slide, slide in here, like right above that USB port. So the less uh, stuff we have sticking out underneath that can short up against the case there, the better. So basically, I'm just going to do that with all of these cables or all these wires, just... Uh, Apply a little bit of solder there to the soldering iron. Have it shrink back a little bit like that. That one there took a little more work, but it's there. So as you can see, this is a pretty easy, especially on these like thinner gauge uh, cables that are going to go to the like the LEDs. So yeah, I'll just go ahead and finish up the rest of these, and then we'll be ready to uh, start soldering onto the uh, boards. So now that I've got all the ends tinned, it's uh, time to start putting them onto the uh, board. And I'm going to start off with the, uh, the rear jack here, and I'm going to put all the wires that go to the LEDs. I'm going to start with those first. And I just decided that I'm going to do uh, red, green, and blue for one, two, three, and then the fourth is going to be the white. And it really helps to have something that can like hold the board for you because trying to maneuver everything at the, at the same time is uh, kind of difficult. And that red one there ended up tinning a little bit further back than I had wanted it to. So I'm going to just tin the hole there and then just kind of touch it up until I can pull a little bit of that wire out so it's not protruding out from this side too much. So that there's pretty good. Do the same for all the rest of them. And it actually, if you put like a little bit of like flux on the board first, I didn't think about that, but if you put a little bit of flux there on these holes, just a tiny little bit. Then what we can do is instead of uh, having to touch the solder to the board, as soon as we do this, we can just put a little bit of solder there on the board or on the soldering iron tip. Put the wire through the hole and touch the hole that we're trying to solder. And that way the, get enough solder there. The, the solder can flow through the hole. It's not very flat. 
there we go. So now that's a good connection there. So I just need to do the rest, uh, or do the same to the rest of all these. And there we go. Actually, that white one didn't take any solder. <laughs> Still stuck, though. There we go. The rest of them are 3 through 10. They go in pairs, and the colors need to stay consistent. So you, it needs to be like either uh, uh, green, white, green, white, green, white, green, white, or, you know, the opposite. But uh, it doesn't matter which uh, arrangement we pick as long as it matches exactly on the other side. That way we don't have the uh, polarity swapped on any of the... Uh, pairs that are going from the uh, jack to the uh, interface board. So I'm going to start by doing the two grounds up here, put those in first, and then I'll do the uh, rest. And basically this board here is done. And then I'll just uh, finish up with this board and it should be ready to install after that. All right, that's all 10 of those. And that's what we've got. And then it always helps to kind of like arrange these a little bit so that they sit nice and flat. So we should have good continuity from this side to this side. Now it's just a matter of uh, put, putting this back into the case here. Although I'm gonna clean off some of the flux residue that's uh, on both of these cables real quick. And this is almost ready to go into the case. The last thing I do want to do is put the uh, bracket into the back of the, or this bracket that's going to support this to the back of the case. Got to pop that into there. And I did mention that what I wanted to do is to uh, make sure that this is going to be able to ground out to the case. So here, I'm just going to use this uh, um, like copper foil tape. And while I don't think that this is like absolutely necessary, I just... Uh, Try to make sure to, that I ground everything that, you know, would normally be grounded, just in case. But I don't think leaving this off would uh, really have too much of an effect. There's that like that, and then I can uh, just poke a little hole in there where the screws are going to go. And what I did is I went looking through my little box of uh, screws, and I just found these two uh, screws here that should fit just fine, that can thread into the plastic. So this is going to go like that. And then these two screws are just going to go in from the bottom. Made them a little on the small side so that screws would thread in there and grab enough material. But I think I made them a little too small. I mean, a really hard time even getting them started. But once they bite, they start driving themselves in, so it's fine. So there we go. Now that's attached. That side's not down all the way. There we go. Now it's flush. And this goes into here. Lock that into place. And now it's just a matter of routing this uh, cable here around the edge. Make sure it stays like nice and flat over here so that it doesn't interfere with the drive caddy that fits over the top. I think I left it a little long, but it's okay. And then on the back, I can pretty much just use the same screws that were holding the display port connector in place. Getting the thread started is the hardest part, and then uh, making sure that it bites all the way through to the plastic is a little bit of a challenge, but there it goes. So that's secure now. We can tuck this all in here. As is, we should be uh, ready to uh, test it and make sure that we're getting some activity at that jack. So I'm just going to get a power supply, I'll plug it into there. I'm going to turn the machine on. I mean, it's not going to boot off of anything, so it's not like I can... Uh, well, I'll see if I got it. Uh, I might have... I might actually have Windows installed on an SSD that I can use this to boot from, and then maybe we can see it in the device manager. But as long as we've got activity going on in these lights, that should be a good indication that this is going to work. All right, so I've got a power supply here that's going to plug into power jack input, and then I've got a RJ45 connection here going to one of my switches. Plug that into there, and let's go ahead and turn it on. This uh, little button up here in the front. Ah, there it goes. There we go, we got activity going. So that seems to be working. Ah, one other quick little thing here before I try to see if, uh, I think this has Windows, but I used a different computer, this was in a different computer before, so I'm not sure if it's gonna work. So anyways, but let's just make sure that 
this thing will fit with the that card in place. And as you can see, it slides in no problem because now there's nothing interfering with the SATA connector right there. So yeah, let me boot the, try to boot this up and see if I get something. Actually, I think I have this other drive here that had an installation of Windows for this machine. So I'll try that instead. Okay, so I found a drive that I could boot Windows from. And in order to capture the video output from this thing, I have to go from a DisplayPort connector to a DVI, DVI to HDMI, because I don't have a cable that will convert DV, uh, DisplayPort directly to a HDMI to capture this. So this is how I had to do it, but it's working. And if we look here at the uh, device manager, we see that this first device here, this uh, Intel Ethernet connection, uh, the i219, that's the built-in controller. And we have another one here, Ethernet controller. So that's going to be that second one. So I'm going to actually plug in the jack here from the first one in, or from that second one into the first one. And then I'm going to see if I can update the drivers for this card. All right, so it took a while to install because it decided that it wanted to update everything. Uh, we can see here now that we uh, do have the the new Ethernet card there populated. So uh, right now I have the cable on the internal uh, built-in uh, Ethernet port. But now if we take that one out of here, plug it into the new one, make sure that these LEDs start blinking, switch back over here. We'll see that, okay, now it's disconnected. And now this one's uh, connected. So it's working. And I mean, no surprise, like <laughs> it's just like sticking in any other uh, network card into a computer. So it works. So yeah, that's it for that. And as I said, I would have preferred if I could have just used the um, the slot up here instead. And I actually did try to use this card with this slot by getting an adapter that goes from the uh, A and E key to the uh, M key type. But unfortunately, when I did have this card in this slot, it just did not want to work like at all and i don't i don't know what the issue was i verified that the uh, contacts going from like this point here were um, going to the proper points on this connector here but it just would refuse to be like recognized by anything so this uh did not work for this either so and that's why i decided to go with uh this method and uh, one last little thing here let's see how this case fits on there with that uh, redesigned uh adapter that I made there. Oops, that did not go in there. It goes. So it just slides on and it comes uh, right over the top. So yeah, that works pretty good. So yep, yeah, that's going to do it for this one. There may be other better ways to do this than the way I did it. I just, um, you know, <laughs> that's what I decided to do and it worked for me. And so maybe uh, this gives you guys some ideas if you're looking to do something similar. So that's going to do it. Uh, Thank you all for watching once again, and I will see you guys around the bench.